Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the Gospel of John Part 2, actually going through the Gospel as we continue our study of the life of Christ. All four Gospel accounts begin with a statement of the true identity of Jesus. In Matthew, it begins, the record of the genealogy of, notice what it refers to him as, Jesus the Christ, or Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and then it goes through to make that case. Mark starts off the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Luke, you don't see it until about verse 35, but still in the first chapter, where as as the Uh, angel comes and speaks to Mary, he prophesies, and he says, the holy child shall be called the Son of God. And finally, John, John, uh, right in chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so, uh, all four Gospels begin telling you who Jesus is, and then it goes from there to prove the point. So let's look at the beginning of John. This is the prologue, John chapter 1, beginning verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. That's a uh, it, what's called an imperfect tense in the Greek text. Uh, it means it's continual action in the past. Uh, you could almost get away with translating it, in the beginning already was the Word, and the, the Word already was with God, and the, the Word already was God. In other words, uh, the Word didn't become something in the beginning. He was there already. And when you start off a book in the beginning, <laughs> to a Jewish reader, of course, he's going to think back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. And you're supposed to. You're supposed to put that together, where in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's in the beginning God did something. But here, in the beginning, not that God did something, but he was something. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the uh, the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And he, that same one, was in the beginning with God. So notice that the word is both God and it's with God. It's 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 a bit of a mystery. Verse 3 all things came into being through him. Again, that reminds us of Genesis 1 where where God creates the heavens and the earth, and here we find that it is him, the word, who brings these things into being, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. So uh, notice how you say it in the positive And then you say the same thing in the negative, in the positive. Um, All things came into being through him. The flip side, the stated, the same truth stated in the in the negative, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Verse four: In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And that reminds us about how back in Genesis one, you you begin the creative days that take place. Uh, Of course, there's six days of creation. And on the first day, God says, let there be light. And so the light is mentioned here. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, when you say he did not comprehend it, you can take that in the Greek text uh, one of two ways. Uh, In the English, you know, to comprehend something is to understand it. Uh, so I almost wish they had translated it. Not that this is necessarily wrong, but I, might, I wish they would have translated it and the darkness did not get it down. <laughs> now you say, well, doesn't that mean the same thing as to comprehend it? You know, I'm, I'm trying to uh, learn a subject. I try to get it down. Uh, yes, but you can also take that in a more literal sense. And the Greek phrase here also can be taken either way. The darkness did not bring it down, although the darkness tried to, or the darkness was not able to to get it down in the sense that it could not comprehend, it could not understand it. Which is in view here? I think possibly both. And John's going to do this in a number of cases, where he'll say something that can be taken one of two ways, and they are both true. And I think perhaps, perhaps he does it deliberately. Now we get down to verse 14. We've been introduced to the Word, but here we see that the Word became something. Uh, Back in in chapter 1, verse 1, the Word in the beginning was the Word. It already was that, but now the Word became something it had not previously, previously been. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, when it says that the word uh, became flesh and dwelt among us, um, that works as a translation. That, that's okay. <laughs> but you can also render that uh, the word became flesh and tented 
or even tabernacled among us. Of course, when you tent with somebody, you're dwelling with them, you're staying with them. Um, but the term that's used there can have that, that nuance, and it reminds us of how God tented with his people. He dwelled with his people. He he tabernacled with them. He he ha- actually gave them instructions to build a tabernacle. And, and then God moved into the building, and he was there with his people. And in a similar sense, a earthly tabernacle, a physical tabernacle, a body was prepared for Jesus, and he dwelt among us. And yet, and yet we saw his glory. It, it peeped out past the body. If you were just to to look at Jesus, physically speaking, he probably looked like any other Jewish person. And yet, there were times when who he really was poked out, uh, shone out from behind the body, as it were, to show that this was glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Now, once we are finished with that prologue, that's verses 1 through 18, we begin now to see Jesus, but but actually, at the first part of chapter 1, uh, we don't meet Jesus initially. Instead, we meet John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is on the scene, and he's baptizing, and he's telling people to be ready for the one who is coming. And uh, uh, we have actually four days in the life, initially, of John, but then uh, we actually have Jesus shows up, and John points to Jesus and said, look, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And two of John's disciples, disciples of John the Baptist, they overhear this. And one of them is Andrew. And the other is, well, he's just the other. He's called the other disciple. Uh, we don't know who he is. Uh, could this be John? I suppose that's, you know, the Apostle John. I, I suppose that's possible. But we're not told, so I don't, I don't want to speculate. But Andrew goes and gets his brother. Uh, his brother is Simon. Who we know him as Simon Peter. He's going to get that nickname. And he brings him to Jesus. Uh, so uh, we have Andrew and the other disciple and Simon Peter, and they begin to follow Jesus. And next we have Philip. Uh, Jesus finds Philip, and, and Philip gets so excited about meeting Jesus, he goes to a friend of his named Nathaniel and says, we have found the Messiah. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And, and, and Nathaniel says, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> Nazareth? I've heard of that little, uh, it, it's a little out of the way place. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Well, well, we'll come and see. And so he comes to meet Jesus. He, he's, he's a bit skeptical. And Jesus sees Nathaniel coming, and he says, behold, an Israelite in whom is no guile, in whom is no deceit. And you have to, you have to understand a little bit of something of, of Jewish names. Uh, not so much the term Israelite, but the term Jacob. Remember, Jacob's other name became Israel. The, the name Jacob actually means deceitful. <laughs> Literally, it means the heel. And, and you know how we have an expression today, pulling somebody's leg to deceive somebody. And yet Jesus says, sees Nathaniel coming, and, and he says, essentially, uh, look, an Israelite in whom is no Jacob, in whom is no deceit. And Nathaniel, evidently that's true, because Nathaniel says, well, how do you know me? And Jesus says, uh, before Philip talked to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Now, I have no idea what happened under the fig tree. And you have no idea what happened under the fig tree. Nobody knows except Nathaniel and Jesus, and neither one of them are telling. But that was enough for Nathaniel to say, oh my goodness, you really are the Christ. And, and Jesus gives him some words of prophecy. Uh, you haven't seen anything yet. Yet You're going to see even more. And he, again, he alludes to something that Jacob had seen. We'll look at that maybe in a future class. We get to chapter 2. In chapter 2, uh, chapter 1 has four days in the life of early life of, of John and Jesus. And then chapter 2 starts off, and three days after that, uh, and it begins with a wedding, a wedding to which Jesus has been invited, and he attends with his disciples, and a social, a, a, a social tragedy takes place. They run out of wine. You say, well, that's not so bad. Just run down to the local uh, pharmacy and buy some more wine. Um, well, apparently they couldn't do that. And so Jesus turns the water into wine. And he does this not in the presence of all. In fact, most people don't even realize it's taken place. Only the servants 
and apparently the disciples of Jesus. They are the only ones that are that are actually privy uh, on the inside of understanding what's taken place as Jesus turns the water into wine, um, and that that marks his first miracle. And we read that the servants believed. And I'm going to assume the disciples that saw it begin to believe as well. Next, uh, there is a Passover. This is going to be the first of a number of Passovers. And Jesus goes to Jerusalem. And while he's in Jerusalem, uh, he sees what's going on in the temple. And he cleanses the temple. And they say, what's that about? And he says, "Uh, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up again. And you think, well, gee, is that a prophecy of like the second and the third temple? And uh, Well, actually, John explains, it's a good thing that he did, because we might not have gotten it otherwise, that Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. Destroy this temple, that is my body, and in three days I will raise it up. Next, we have a series of conversations. So in chapter 3, we have a conversation of one named Nicodemus. He's a ruler of the Jews, a Pharisee, who comes to Jesus by night. We're not told why he came by night. Was he trying to hide? Was this the only time that Jesus had free? Uh, We don't know. And Jesus speaks to Nicodemus about the importance of being born again. Now, again, this is one of those phrases, uh, to be born from uh, again. Or you could take that same Greek phrase and translate it to be born again. From above. Well, which is it? Is it a new birth or is it a, a birth from above? And my answer is both. Again, this is one of those examples where John uses a, a phrase that can be taken either way, and they are both true. And he speaks to Nicodemus about how he must be born again, born from above, born with this other birth. Next, we have John the Baptist, who's still around, <laughs> and and John the Baptist is out there baptizing. And meanwhile, Jesus, actually his disciples have been baptizing. Jesus is actually baptizing anybody, but his disciples are. And the somebody points out to the disciples of John the Baptist, wait a minute, um, people are starting to go more to Jesus than to John the Baptist. And and the disciples of John the Baptist take a little bit of a front to that. They, they go to John the Baptist. They say, can you tell him to stop that? You know? And John says, no, that's appropriate because he must increase and I must decrease. And that's what we're about. The third conversation is in chapter 4 with a Samaritan woman. And uh, Jesus is going through Samaria. Now, usually when you go from from Jerusalem up to Galilee, you would take a detour. But Jesus didn't take the detour, at least not on this occasion. He goes through Samaria. He meets the Samaritan woman by the well, and he speaks to her about living water. Now, living water was a phrase they used back then to describe flowing water. But again, he's taking the phrase and he's saying, no, there really is life to what he gives. He's not speaking about just just water, water in a well or water from a brook, but actual spiritual water, that which gives life. And he points out that God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And you have to approach God on the basis of this inner spirit spiritual life. Next, we move to what I'd like to call feast teachings. So there's that unnamed feast in chapter 5. Is that a Passover? Is that some other feast? Uh, I don't know for sure, so I don't want to say. Um, But at this feast, there is a lame man. He's uh, by the pool of Bethesda. uh, I started to say little pool. Actually, it's quite large. uh, On the north side of the town, just to the north of the Temple Mount. Um, It's got uh, sort of multi-stories. You can go there today and walk through it. Um, And there is a lame man there, and the lame man is healed. Uh, the problem is it's on the Sabbath, and that that creates quite of a, a stir. And they say, you know, who do you think you are healing on the Sabbath? And he said, well, you know, there's others that already testify of me. Uh, there's John. There's the father, <laughs> as evidenced by this miracle. And somebody who couldn't walk is now walking. And there are the scriptures, and they all testify of me. Next, there is a Passover. So is this a year later or sometime uh, later? But in chapter 6, there is still another Passover. And this time, uh, on the event of this, uh, there is the feeding of the 5,000. This is up in Galilee that this takes place. And then to sort of underscore what he has just done in feeding the 5,000, he says, "Uh, but I 
I'm the bread of life. Uh, you must, you must eat me. You must eat of my body, and drink of my blood. And people hear this and they go, "Yuck! Oh, we don't want to do that. That sounds terrible." And a lot of the people, a lot of the people leave, except for the twelve. And so Jesus has gone from uh, from having great crowds to having down to twelve. Now, now there's going to be other crowds that come back. But, but this is a, an interesting time. And Jesus actually turns to Peter and says, are, are, are you guys going to? And Peter says, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We come to chapter 7. Chapter 7 and 8 take place in the fall. This was known as the Feast of Booze. You can also call it the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, Feast of Sukkot. That's just how you say it in, in Hebrew. Um, and at this feast, uh, Jesus says, come to me and drink. Uh, you see, at this feast, there was actually a, a uh, water ceremony where they would take a pitcher of water as a libation and they would pour it out. And in the midst of this, Jesus says, I am the living water. You must come to me and drink. And then in explaining who he is, this is in chapter 8, he says, before Abraham was, I am. One of those I am statements. Now, what we've seen through this section are seven signs from chapter 2 to chapter 11. Seven miracles. Uh, notice that we begin, and this is set up, uh, I think, in a sort of a chiastic format. That is, uh, their balanced format, where, where the first miracle um, relates in some sort of way to the last miracle. Uh, water is turned to wine. That's at a wedding. Um, and uh, you have uh, Lazarus raised. And the, that's a funeral. Actually, the funeral's already over. But you get the idea. So there's a time of rejoicing. There's a time of mourning. And they sort of form bookends, uh, one at the beginning, one at the end of this miracle. Next, notice there is a son who is healed. And in chapter 9, there is a blind man who sees. Now, these are both healing miracles, but you say, well, that's, that's not that distinctive. There's other healing miracles, too. But what makes them special is that both of these miracles are performed long distance. That is, when the son is healed, Jesus is not there with the son. Uh, his father has come uh, 18 miles uh, down from, from uh, uh, another town. And he shows up and Jesus says, go home, your son is healed. And he goes and he's healed. Same thing with the blind man. Uh, Jesus sees the blind man in the temple. Jesus says to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. The pool of Siloam is at the other end of the city. It's at the south end of the city, uh, which means that this blind man has to go all the way down there. He's blind. Um, he has to make his way uh, through, the, through his own personal darkness to wash in the pool. But when he comes back, now he can see. And so those are both long-distance miracles. Next, you have the lame man at a pool and Jesus walking on water, uh, sort of evident both of these miracles involve water. And then the central one is the feeding of the 5,000. So you see these seven signs, and, and they're, they're given in sort of a topical order like that. I'm not saying they didn't necessarily take place like that, but, but the order is topical. And we're meant to see these signs through the eyes of the disciples. And they are said to be growing in their belief. You see, um, uh, he turns the water into wine, and we read, and they believed. And then a little later in the chapter, Jesus does something, and they believed. And they're growing in their faith, in their belief, as they see the signs. And we are meant to be growing with them as we see the signs through their eyes. Now, we've already noted the Gospel of John is set up in two parts. You've got the public ministry, the private ministry. You have a period of about three years, chapters 1 through 11. And then beginning in chapter 12, we have the Passion Week, where Jesus has been earlier all throughout Israel, but now he comes to Jerusalem. And we'll pick up next time as we look at the private ministry of Jesus.